<coughs> Good evening. This is the third part of my lectures on Goblin Market, and I think this will be the final part. Uh, the uh, idea is to create a different perspective and a different understanding on this very famous poem and to uh, try to analyze it in a different way, which I think offers a fresh viewpoint to this poem. A lot of it is what I have uh, understood from reading the poem by making a mental comparison with other poems who have this very deep religious element uh, and uh, uh, a drama also like Dr. Faustus which also grapples with the idea of temptation and sin and I think Satan in Milton's Paradise Lost is one of the famous famous very uh, 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 captivating uh, anti-heroes who has this tremendous power because of the moral dilemma which goes on and the conflict which occurs in his soul. Dilemma or conflict is an essential part of any uh, story or drama or any poem which brings it to a resolution and either it can be a tragic ending or a happy ending. Uh, like in this particular uh, poem, Goblin Market, I, in the la my last lecture, I called it is as falling short of greatness, as not having the same kind of sublime quality which uh, plays like Dr. Faustus have or, of course, Milton's masterpiece, uh, Go uh, Paradise Lost, because they have this essential uh, spiritual thought or spiritual conflict, the characters have a level of ambiguity which again raises or elevates any work of art, whether it is in writing or painting or uh, any other form of art. You have to be able to strip the layers of meaning to find the different types of ambiguity in the famous words, the seven types of ambiguity, that is, I think, a critical essay by F.R. Lewis. Correct me if I am wrong, as far as I remember. But let us take this goblin market and why it does not have that moral dilemma. It reads like a picture book story. It is definitely a moral fable set in a very archaic setting. There's uh, no reason to doubt it because uh, the two young girls, the virgins rather, uh, they seem to exist in a land where they are at peace and it seems to be a kind of a fairy tale setting, which I had mentioned earlier also. And uh, the two characters, the two chaste young girls whose chastity is under threat by the idea of the lashvicious evil goblin men who ogle at them and offer them the tantalizing fruit, the fruit being a token of uh, their downfall. Again, the story or the Christian fame, idea of uh, the sinful fruit or the forbidden fruit as leading to the downfall, uh, which is the foundation of a Christian theology, but what my suggestion is that these two char characters, they are like Laura and Lizzie, they represent good and bad. They don't have any extra dimensions. Uh, Laura is curious and she is tempted, she is lured by the offer of the fruits and knowing it is wrong, she eats the fruit and the sin manifests itself in her. Lizzie represents the other side of human nature, while Laura is the dark side, we might say, because uh, we have both the perspectives or both the uh, possibilities in our nature. So uh, Laura represents the dark side, and Lizzie is the pure and the virginal young girl who knows what is right and what is wrong. In their characters, there is no complexity. They are either black or white. Again, this idea of 
sin and virtue, vice and virtue, vice versa to each other, I'm being, either being black or white, with no ambiguity, with no complexity, with no enigma, um, enigma to it, is an idea which is present in these monastic religions which have this Brahminic beliefs and they, there is no room in between. Uh, this, uh, uh, according to uh, their concept of what con uh, the laws of the universe are, they are in constant antithesis with each other and there is no room in between. Truth is more complex. In uh, other systems of belief, like for Hinduism, for instance, not that I'm promoting any religion, but I just feel that there is a lot of space for grey because we all know that truth it cannot be simplified in either this or that, either completely black or completely white. There has to be some kind of uh, possibility which uh, uh, keeps uh, uh, something from defining itself or categorizing in a perfect manner. There is no, there's boundaries are always fluid and that I find is a very uh, realistic concept. Coming back to Goblin Market, we find that again, I'm uh, repeating myself, Laura represents the dark side of the human nature and Lizzie represents the pure side of human nature or human character because good and evil reside in both of us and the conflict does not arise within them. L Laura sins and she, uh, the moment she sins, she is doomed for despair, for decay, for damnation, for perdition and for a very long suffering, prolonged suffering and finally an end when even the grave will be cursed as Janie's was and as Lizzie reminds her. But both the sisters don't have any moral conflict or any moral dilemma because Laura has decided and uh, again it is significant that she uh, buys the fruit with a lock of her hair. I would remind you of Dr. Faustus and his sins or the moment he uh, betrays himself or his deepest instincts or his belief, his faith by signing away his soul he does it with his blood and that idea of blood also is uh, a very uh, significantly Christian idea because Christ's blood was given to wash away the sins of mankind. So it was life or soul, it has this divinity because it is a reminder of God's presence in us and to give away that soul to the arch enemy of God that is the sa Satan or Lucifer is an act of betrayal which Faustus commits and so his body also rebels against him and at that moment the blood, blood uh, refuses to flow. But then in this uh, poem, uh, Laura and Lizzie, they are representing the opposite spectrums of mankind and they are black or white and again like I said there is a total lack of compl uh, complexity. What elevates a piece of art or a piece of work or a piece of literature to greatness is that element of conflict. We find it in Macbeth when he is tempted, no doubt. No, it's not a spiritual conflict as it happens in um, Milton's Paradise Lost or Faustus's or uh, Dr. Faustus's uh, ambition, the struggle between his uh, ambition and his arrogance and his faith to God. But that was a Renaissance spirit. Dr. Faustus was written in the Renaissance time, uh, in the 16th century, Milton's Paradise Lost, is it comes in the uh, 17th century. And of course, we all know that Goblin Market is a part of the pre-Raphaelite um, uh, poems, the group who, began, who, who were painters as well as po poets and who started writing in uh, 18, 48, around 1848, going against the prevalent stream of the Victorian poets. So the talking of that 
sublime quality it occurs in macbeth when he has this conflict within his heart where the weakness of his character propels him in one direction and at the same time he knows it is wrong it occurs in the indecision of hamlet also when he tries to convince himself or he tries to find answers to his doubts satan of course is the greatest creation uh, among the greatest creations in uh, english literature where we do not abhor satan but the magnificence of his uh, character is that we admire the potential for greatness which was present in his character and which was destroyed because of the choices which he made which he chose to rebel against god but this idea of crossing the boundaries of being at uh, having a desire to reach out for something which is denied dr foster does the same thing he reaches out for knowledge which is not for his uh, not for him and he chooses the wrong, wrong means or he makes the wrong choices so the matter of choices is also something which marks a character as having the potential or the possibility to reach greatness or to go a spiral towards doom so what i felt when i read this poem was that certainly it is an interesting poem like i have described in my last classes also the uh, treatment with its uh, overtones and undertones of sensuousness the blatant sexuality the idea of the lecherous goblin men ogling at this, these two young beautiful young girls and at the same time not only leering at them but at that instance when lizzy refuses even molesting her man handling her and violating her but of course she stands her ground and her virtue remains untarnished again this brings me back or this brings me back again to the idea of vice and virtue in the victorian age or before that there were such definite ideas of what was vice and what was virtue so these ideas were of course based in the religious thought in the theological beliefs we can say or in the concepts of religion but now in the modern times we are forced to rethink or we can understand that what considers what is uh, you know the virtue in this poem in instance it is the chastity of the two young maidens and because the way the poem is presented it was and it is quite a uh uh i think krishna georgina rosetti she has been much ahead of her times because you must remember that this was the victorian age the age of prudery uh, the age of uh, that overriding consciousness of propriety and this poem would be considered very very bold and it was at sure of it because uh, if uh, we are reminded that when wuthering heights that great classic when it was written or when it came out in the public after publication it was considered a book which had to be banned because they were shocked by the sheer violence and the intensity of the emotions dh lawrence's lady chatterley's lover was banned in spite of the fluidity of the prose and the artistic quality of the book so it also uh, is re- uh, quite uh, remarkable because of the images and of course uh, mm, uh, there is no doubt about the mm, sexual overtones and the erotic quality of the poem but vice and virtue these are the ideas behind this poem and these two girls uh, laura and lizzy they one is virtuous 
and one has sinned. And of course the fact that she is saved comes because Lizzie risking herself, she does not offer anything which belongs to her, but she takes the coin, she takes a coin, she takes uh, money. She is not, she knows that she cannot ransom her physical self in any way. She cannot allow uh, the goblins to have any kind of power over her. And so she takes the coin, but if, 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 when the goblins give her back a coin and smear her with fruit, this fruit which she manages to bring back for her sister, Laura, it washes away the sin because this fruit is not tainted. It is. It does not have that mark of corruption. And so sin, this purity of her love or the fact that she has won a moral victory over the uh, infernal goblins, again I will remind you that it is the men, the emphasis is on men and that is why those um, uh, conjectures about whether it is it can be read with a feminist perspective or not. Well, like I said, we can read literature any way we want to. But this poem, though outstanding, and uh, which has a definite um, unique quality about it because of the treatment of the theme, is a moral fable, but it has a picture book quality. It does not have that moral complexity which can elevate it to the level of greatness. It does not have a spiritual conflict it does not have a moral dilemma because Laura and Lizzie are two opposite ends of the spectrum, black and white. There is nothing in between. And this is, uh, again, a very uh, inflexible and a very, very uh, a narrow definition of what can be right or what can be wrong is the basis of this poem. It, it does not have the ambiguity which is a mark of great literature because uh, like I said, uh, Satan in spite of the fact that he is the evil, he is the devil incarnate, has that greatness, that power, that magnetic quality, that ability to inspire emotion. Laura and Lizzie, they appear more like cardboard characters and of course the end with its a uh, very uh, convenient uh, end to the story is sort of contrived and it seems to put a very uh, typical end to a story, to a moral fable, to something which uh, does not have any added dimensions like Dr. Foster's and Lucifer from or, uh, uh, Satan from Milton's Paradise Lost or Shakespearean tragic heroes Macbeth or Hamlet where in spite of their tragic end they rise to a level of sublimity which is because of the greatness in their character because of the nobility because of the qualities with, because of the immense potential which they possessed. Laura and Lizzie, sadly, they, like I said, they are just like representations of good and evil and uh, being uh, two very chaste and untouched and virginal young girls, they seem to be the right symbol for uh, a kind of, we can say, uh, lesson, a moral lesson, which is taught to the world at large. And um, But apart from that, it is what I feel, a moral fable in a very picture book setting. And I think uh, this shows that there are not too many layers to this poem uh, and it can be read with just one viewpoint and of course like I said feminist and masculine perspective but 
the moral complexity is not there because when Dora makes a choice, she does not struggle with herself. She does not hesitate. For her, there is that is the only option. And for Lizzie, she is the virtuous one, and she is someone who walks the straight and narrow path, and who redeems not only herself but her sister as well. So a quaint poem, no doubt, very interesting because of the um, uh, contradiction in the theme, uh, not the theme as per se, but the, between the treatment and the theme, the very moral theme and the highly sensualized treatment of the theme. So I think this will finish my analysis of Goblin Market and uh, of course the readers, the listeners, those who like to analyze and think can find their own viewpoints in this poem. But for me, the main points are that it is a moral fable in a picture book setting. It has the two characters who do not have any added dimensions because they represent black and white, vice and virtue. Uh, uh, and uh, they do not struggle with any moral dilemma or any spiritual conflict but they make their own choices and finally the poem which moves quickly because the poem also moves very rapidly it comes to a happy ending so that is all